Hello, differential equations. Um, <clears throat> welcome back. So, uh, you know, if we, we've got this mass on a spring, uh, <clears throat> and of course we have damping. Now, if we add a forcing function, that's a driving force, or a, it, it, it's driving it, you know. Anyway, that makes it non-homogeneous. Uh, and you learned in chapter four when all of a sudden it's non-homogeneous, the solution x, the position function x, has an xc and an xp. Back in chapter four we used the letter y, yc and yp. But this is, so you have an xc and an xp. So you remember, I guess, that the xc was the solution to the homogeneous version of this. So, you know, you pretend this is homogeneous, you get the xc, and, you know, it's damped. And uh, so I'm, I just made up, pretend we got this, this answer for the non-homogeneous part. So this is my XC. And then the driving force might have been some sine or cosine function. So I'm pretending I went and I found the XP. I had to make my guess for my XP. I went and found the A and the B, and I ended up here with my XP. So this is my uh, solution, uh, X. By the way, you know, there would have been a C1 and C2 here, and there would have been initial conditions, and I would have used those initial conditions to find C1 and C2. Make sure you realize you got to find C1 and C2 after you find X, not, not, not back on the XC. I mean, the, the C1 and C2 are on the XC, but you have to wait till you have the entire X before you can use your initial conditions. Just a, just a thought. Um, so, you know, if I graph this, just the XC, it, that's damped. Uh, by, in fact, it's overdamped is what it is, and there's a picture of it right there. It's that black line. It just dies. I don't think it ever crosses zero. I tried to look at it. Um, if I just graph the XP, it's a sine function with an amplitude of 6. So there it is in the dotted line. But the solution x is the sum of these two functions, you know? And so you are actually summing the y values here. You're adding these functions together, of course. But graphically, you're adding these together. So it's like you're adding these y values. And so they interfere with each other. And here's the result. Uh, the result is um, <clears throat> that right here at the beginning, this is x. So now I'm going to draw a picture of x. Uh, right at the beginning, uh, this, this XP is influencing this XC. And we actually get a little kick up here, except I'm sorry, that's down. <laughs> and then it does this, and then it starts to do this. Now, no, because notice, there's uh, this XC is this damped part of the problem is basically going to zero. So it doesn't take long to where its influence on the answer is insignificant. And so the graph of the final answer here in purple kind of looks like this. Eventually, it just looks like this. I mean, it, 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 the XP goes to zero. I'm sorry. The XC goes to zero, and the XP ends up being the solution. You know, at the, at the beginning, there's a little interference, a little uh, 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 superposition where they add together and create this a little bit of uh, motion there. But, but after that, this basically is a zero. It's adding nothing, contributing nothing to the answer, and the, the, the entire x really just looks like the xp. The words we use for that are these. Uh, we call this the transient part of the solution, the transient solution or part of the solution. And we call this the steady state part of the solution. So I think I asked you for that on your test. I think the book might have some problems like that. It's just a little quick terminology to understand. Uh, the word transient, you could look it up. And uh, I think it kind of means uh, temporary or, or yeah, uh, temporary, fleeting. Um, transient solution. I think of a, a transient, a college student that's a transient student is, is, a, is a student at UF who comes down in CF just for the summer to take one class. They're a transient student, then they go back. They're kind of temporary. Uh, they're kind of just passing through. 
you know, sometimes we refer to the homeless population as transients. I'm not sure if that's a bad word, but sometimes they're just passing through, although there's a good bunch of homeless population that actually just stays here. Um, but anyway, the word, I'm just trying to explain the word transient uh, and steady state. Uh, and and the, the purple answer is the, is the ultimate answer, the sum of these two. Um, I'm going to keep talking here a second. Uh, I'm going to erase this, get rid of this. Now, so our language and our, and, and our situation changes just a little when we get rid of damping. So when we don't have any damping, <clears throat> so no damping, you know, now we have MX double prime plus KX, and you've been working on that, I hope. That's good old simple harmonic motion. Uh, but then when you add a forcing function to good old simple harmonic motion, it's a little interesting, and we don't really use that terminology because that simple harmonic motion does not go away. Um, now, I wanted to just pretend I had, you know, so, so pretend we had a problem, pretend we got our answer, and pretend our answer was this. The XC was simple harmonic motion. Maybe you put it into the, uh, maybe you put it into... The alternative form, so I, I, I put my <clears throat> XC, you know, which was a simple harmonic motion, the sum of a sine and a cosine, I put it into um, uh, the alternative form here with an amplitude and a phase angle, okay, and now I have the XP, now I'm just going to pretend that the, the, the original function over here was, an, was also a, a cosine or a sine function with a slightly different frequency. So I'm gonna make up a problem here. I'm gonna pretend I have this two cosine uh, 1.8 T. So again, I didn't even give you a problem. I'm pretending that this is the answer that came from some problem. And this is interesting. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, they, they have different frequencies. Um, so they're basically sines and cosines, you know, are roughly the same graph. I could use sines or cosines here. But anyway, but their frequencies are a little off. Now, those numbers are not the frequencies. Well, hang on. Uh, and those numbers are not the period either. Those numbers uh, are called omega, uh, those not coefficients in front of t. That is how you find the period. 2 pi divided by omega is the period. The reciprocal of the period is the frequency. 2 pi divided by that number is the period. The reciprocal of the period is the frequency. So, they're, so when I point to those numbers, those aren't the frequencies, but they have close frequencies due to those close numbers. And the result is beautiful. Um, and of course, these graphs <clears throat> superimpose upon each other. And so um, what happens is they're, they're kind of in sync. And if you were to draw this graph, use your graphing calculator and play around, uh, for the first 30 seconds or so, I think what you would see is that they're, they're what we would call constructive interference. They're kind of lined up, and, and the waves are adding together. The, the, hot, the peaks of the waves are adding to the peaks of the waves and amplifying the waves. Of course, then they get a little out of sync because they're not perfectly in sync, so they get a little out of sync, and then they diminish, and they diminish a little, but then they get back in sync and start to increase again. I think the word would be constructive interference and then destructive interference. It's a beautiful pattern. I would set my window to like 0 to 30 or 0 to 90. It's fun to play around. Uh, negative, I don't know, negative 10 to 10 maybe on, the, on here. And it's fun to play with your calculator and just play with some of these graphs. And you, again, you would see these beautiful sine and cosine waves, and they're almost in sync, and I think they call these beats uh, <clears throat> in physics. You call this, they refer to these as beats. Um, anyway, um, now, what would happen if this had the frequency of 2t, or <clears throat> this had the 2t, and what if this non-homogeneous part had a cosine 2t? Well, remember, we would have dependency. And if we had dependency, we would uh, 
uh, we'd have to multiply, oh, we'd have to multiply by t. When we have to guess our xp, we'd have to multiply by a t. So just for fun, let's pretend we did one of these problems because they're kind of hard to do. I think you have to do one on your test. <laughs> but when you have dependency, let's just say we did the dependency and now we've got this. Something like this came out as our answer. So this was the XC, this is the XP. Notice I'm not using the word transient and steady state anymore. Nobody's going away. Uh, this is, we are in an undamped situation, kind of an ideal situation here. And anyway, now this is awesome. When uh, now they, they're, they're, they're totally in sync. And so all we have is constructive interference. We don't even have destructive interference. So it's fun to play around with this graph and look at some various windows. But what it does is this. It's total constructive interference. These, uh, the wave just grows and grows and grows and grows. What's going to happen to the spring? At some point, the spring breaks, the mass flies off. Anyway, the word for that is pure resonance. Again, it's a kind of an ideal situation because you have to get pure resonance, you have to ignore damping. <clears throat> but there are plenty of places where you have terrible, you could have some terrible constructive interference that causes the spring to break. Uh, even if it's not pure resonance. But this, you know, again, you can think of it like this. What is the amplitude of this guy? The amplitude of this is growing. As time grows, the amplitude grows. The amplitude grows to infinity. That's a good way to think of it. All right, good. I'm glad I got all that in in 11 minutes, uh, 12 minutes. Thanks for listening. Keep working hard.